Good evening. This is Julie Gilo, and along with Carolyn Hartness tonight, I'd like to welcome you back for part two of fetal alcohol syndrome and related conditions. This um, training is offered to you um, via the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services and the Foster Parent Training Institute, and it's a program that's called Kids Come First. And Carolyn and I were here last week, and we did part one, and tonight we're back to do part two. So hopefully you will um, be able to sit back and enjoy and um, call us with questions or comments or concerns, and we'll be able to answer those as we go through the evening tonight. Um, my name is Julie Gilo, and I am the family advocate at the University of Washington Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Diagnostic <coughs> and Prevention Network. It's quite a mouthful. We're based at the University of Washington in Seattle, and we're the core site here for seven clinics that are um, set up throughout the state of Washington. I'm also a um, foster parent co-trainer for Region 3, which is Snohomish County and North, and my husband and I are currently parenting um, seven children who have been diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome or related conditions. And this is my co-trainer tonight, Carolyn Hartness. Hi, I am Carolyn Hartness, and I was hosting last week and uh, enjoyed that very much, and I'm here to support Julie tonight, who's going to handle most of the evening in discussing behavior and intervention. I do fetal alcohol syndrome education and training around the state, uh, been most of the places around the United States, Canada, and even abroad. I feel this is a very important subject, and I'm especially happy to be talking to foster parents tonight. If you want to call in, if you have questions at any point or comments, please call us at 1-800-407-9487. Thank you, Julie. Well, we have a few housekeeping things that we need to take care of. Um, actually, if you could, I'm going to read off the, the various um, sites, the satellite sites that are going on right now throughout the state of Washington, and I'm going to read those off and assign you times that if you could call into that 1-800 number, the 800-407-9487, and give us your roster count, we'd really appreciate that. So, Aberdeen, Hoquiam, and Anacortes, if you could call it 615 with the number of participants at your site. Chehalis, Clarkston, and Cusick Kalispell Tribe at 630. Forks, Goldendale, and Kelso at 645, please. Long Beach, Linwood, and Edmonds, and Nespelum and Colville Tribe at 7 p.m. At 7.15, if Newport, Olympia, and OMAC could call in. At 7.30, Pasco, Port Angeles, and Port Hadlock. At 7.45, Port Orchard, Bremerton, Puyallup, and Tacoma. And at 8 o'clock, Walla Walla, Welpinit, Spokane Tribe, and Yakima. If you could call in please at those times and give um, us your roster count for attendance for the evening, that would be wonderful. And for those of you who are uh, watching tonight via your computer at home on, on webcast, if you could email us and let us know that you are actually online with us just so that we can give you credit for actually um, attending and completing the hours tonight. So if you could do that, that would be wonderful. We will offer many times throughout the evening tonight the opportunity to call in or to email us with questions, um, and we will have a couple of breaks throughout the evening also. So with that, Carolyn, would you like to just spend a couple of minutes and review briefly what we covered last week, and um, then we'll go on to tonight's topic. Sure. Um, I do have a request, however. I am a little distracted by music playing in my ear. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so if I start dancing around, uh, I'm hearing a great song. Anyway, last week, may, mostly what we just talked about well, is what is fetal alcohol syndrome. 
And obviously what it is is something that is caused by mother drinking during the pregnancy because to have a syndrome you have to have physical characteristics. Those characteristics are created by the alcohol that affects the fetus during the development during pregnancy. What we're looking for in clinic when we do diagnosis is a particular set of facial features. People who have FAS look more like each other than they do their family and even sometimes their race and if they're young enough even sometimes uh, look more like uh, the other sex possibly. Um, we're also looking for growth deficiency and we're looking for central nervous system damage and particularly we want to know did mom drink. When we're looking at the facial features, we are looking at very short eye slits. We're looking for a lack of the filter, the little zipper under your nose, and a very thin upper lip. Growth deficiency is tiny, below the third centile. And then the brain dysfunction is the most difficult thing to look at because when you have something like microcephaly, which means small head, or you experience seizures, or we have an MRI that shows holes in your brains, that's a simple way to diagnose for brain damage. However, when we're looking at behavior and test scores, there's more of a discussion area, and that's something that uh, Julie and I have talked about a lot. And as we're part of the clinic at the University of Washington, that tends to be a great deal of discussion. And I think that's what she will be touching on mostly this, this evening, is looking at behaviors uh, and, and trying to assess what kind of brain damage we're looking at and then how do you deal with, this, with the child in your home? What are the best interventions? So that was just a little bit of what we did last week. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. So um, Car what Carolyn was saying is, is very true. And tonight the primary um, focus of our discussion tonight will be on behaviors and interventions and strategies. And as we go through that, I will use actually pictures of my children and stories and examples of things that have happened in our household or at the, my children's schools, um, which I hope will trigger, trigger um, concerns and issues and questions that you may have in regards to the children that you have and that you've been taking care of. So if we can get started and have slide number one, please. If you'll remember from last week, we talked a little bit about how the medical diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome actually was not recognized until 1973. And at that point, it was recognized um, in two areas of the world. There were two research projects going on at the same time. One was here in the Seattle area, one was in France, and both of them came at almost the, simultaneously up with a group of babies and toddlers who were very, very small for gestational age. And they all looked alike. And as they, these two groups did their research, they found that the only common denominator that they could actually find was that mom actually drank a substantial amount of alcohol during her pregnancies with these babies. So the medical diagnosis in the medical world has actually not been um, accepted or been talked about or, or looked at as a diagnosis until, until 1973. And in the general population amongst parents and educators and, and other people, probably only in the last 10 to 15 years. But back thousands of years ago, we've already, we were talking about what happens when moms drink during pregnancy. And back in 427 BC, Plato says, alcohol should be barred to any man or woman. Now notice that, I think that was <laughs> quite interesting. He says man or woman, who is intending to create children. Children should not be made in bodies saturated with drunkenness. In 322 BC, Aristotle says, foolish, drunken, or harebrained women for the most part bring forth children like unto themselves, difficult and listless. Next slide, please. In 1899, W.C. Sullivan, who was a researcher in, back in the late 1800s, said that alcoholic women have a stillbirth and infant death rate of 56%, more than double that of their non-drinking female relatives. So I just want you to um, you know, see that even though we've only talked about it in the medical communities and in our you know, communities here at home for less than 30 years, it actually has been talked about in a number of arenas for thousands of years. Um, it's actually mentioned in the Bible and you know, we have philosophers and researchers who have been talking about it for a long, long time. Um, next slide, please. What my slides tonight are actually going to be a mixture of a lot of things, cartoons, um, pictures of children, 
um, a few statistics, but most of them are to kind of just trigger my mind to be able to relate instances and situations and examples to you. So, and, uh, Julie, I just think we should note that these uh, cartoon slides belong to Linda yes. Lefevre, who is Danny Lefevre's mother. She's an educator in the field of, of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, and she's given us permission to use these tonight, and they're delightful. Thank you. So this slide, actually, I want you to just, you know, think about our kids. And, you know, my children are like night and day. And by that, I don't mean, well, I do mean, actually, that they are all different. Um, I have seven children diagnosed in my home right now. None of them um, have the same behaviors at any given time. Um, none of them respond to specific stimuli, um, sometimes the same from day to day. But my children can flop from being very happy, very outgoing, very um, friendly, to almost not always sad, but what I sometimes think of as shut down. And oftentimes where I see that happening is especially if they've had a very stimulating day. Um, my children all seem to be very sensitive to sensory kinds of stimulation. If we are in a room with like fluorescent lights, my daughter Tessa can hear them buzz. And if you think about what's in our school rooms at school, they're almost all lit by fluorescent lighting. Um, some of my children are very auditorily sensitive. And so like sitting in the cafeteria for lunch, going to assemblies um, at school, those are very difficult situations. And when they get overwhelmed or they get they've been taking in too much stimulation, they actually shut down and they become almost non-responsive. Matter of fact, when Brandon comes home, I can usually tell what kind of a day he's had because if it's been pretty stimulating, he will get off the bus, he'll go into his room, um, crawl underneath the, the comforter, cover himself up, and he lays in there and he rocks back and forth and back and forth and just literally shutting out the world. And then when he's quieted his sensory um, self down, then he comes back out to the rest of the family. And I think it's important here to note, and we will be, I hope, thinking about this the entire evening, is that what we're talking about is, again, children who have the same diagnosis, fetal alcohol syndrome, but who express it in a, in a very different way. Alcohol does not cause behavior. Alcohol causes brain damage. The brain damage is then filtered and presented through environmental issues, nutritional issues, uh, prenatal and postnatal issues, and also just the basic personality of the children. So finding out that somebody has fetal alcohol syndrome is very useful as far as the diagnosis because it will tell you exactly how they express uh, the central nervous system damage. Great. Yes, that's so true. Next slide, please. My kids also have great mood swings. Oh, can we back up one? I need to see one that looks like a little teddy bear and a cactus. <laughs> there we go. Great. Um, in addition to being like night and day, my kids are also very sensitive as far as their moods. And this particular slide always reminds me of my daughter, Tessa. Tessa will be nine years old now in less than a month and has lived with us and been with us since she was 11 months old. And Tessa, every morning, my husband leaves um, at 5 a.m. in the morning to go to work and I can set my clock by Tessa. And by 5.15, I could open one eye and generally she'll be standing there by my bed and saying, Mom, can I come lay with you? And she'll crawl into bed and she'll cuddle and she'll snuggle just like that warm little teddy bear there and be very soft, very cuddly, very, um, you know, just smell good and all of that. And then an hour and a half after that, our alarm will go off and, you know, sometimes she could rage for the rest of the day in the morning if we don't get the socks, the seams of her socks lined up right. And so those are um, very, very you know, difficult things and it's hard for other people to understand in our situation when my children can be, um, you know, that warm little cuddly, cuddly teddy bear one minute and then quickly change over into that prickly pear cactus. You know, when Linda was developing these uh, little cartoon images, uh, she was thinking about her son Danny's behavior. And what she realized was that many times these, what seemed to be mood swings in him, were really his reactions to his environment. 
like everything would be fine, he would be happy, uh, affectionate, and suddenly not, suddenly either shut down or irritable. And she would find that perhaps something in the room changed. There was an elevated noise, e even outside possibly, not just in the room, mm -hmm. but there was an elevation in the noise level. Uh, or he had put something on and the texture of it uh, didn't feel good, like she said about turning the socks so that the... Uh, uh, seams are on the uh, outside rather than the inside. Sometimes the parents are turning the clothing the other way, clipping tags out of the back, and really looking, and I think later we'll be talking a lot about setting up uh, interventions based on how you are dealing with the environment that the child is in, and it is not always just mood. It's not always uh, strictly emotional changes. It's just that the physical environment may cause what we, we uh, read as an emotional issue for the child. That's right. So what appears to us as, you know, a mood swing right. is actually, if we looked at it, we could figure it out via the environment. Right. But that's harder for us to do sometimes. <laughs> the okay. challenge. That's the challenge. <laughs> that's right. The next slide, please. That was our mischief maker. The mischief versus willful disobedience. Now, you know, can my kids be mischievous? Of course they can. And actually, some of them are very good at it. They've practiced it well. But what... I hear oftentimes that I, and I get phone calls from sometimes Special Olympic coaches, sometimes um, special education teachers, or whatever at school, saying that one of my kids has been willfully disobedient that day. And that's where I have um, a tendency to disagree with them, because to me, to be willful and to be willfully disobedient means that you need to understand what your behavior is, you know, going to cause. So what's going to happen? What's the consequence going to be because of something that you are doing or saying or, or those kinds of things? And my children really do not have that ability. Um, so while on one hand my children can be mischievous, and but for that to be interpreted as being willful disobedience, I think, you know, is where I need to be um, an educator for, an advocate for my children. Mm -hmm. I always look at this slide and think, you know, our children don't sit around and, and think about how to get in trouble. That's right. Trouble, unfortunately, <laughs> sort of follows them around. I mean, when you are unable to figure out action and consequence, connect cause and effect, understand right from wrong, you're definitely going to run afoul of That's someone. Right. That's right. And your, you know, even innocent mischievousness is right. going to be interpreted as right. something else. Um, next slide, please. Parenting um, our children is, I just love this thing, trying to parent a child with fetal alcohol syndrome is like trying to get around Seattle with a map of San Francisco. And, you know, when my husband and I first um, became foster parents about 10, 10 and a half years ago, we spent the first year and a half of our foster parenting career thinking that we were crazy because absolutely <laughs> and nothing. They are. And we are. But... <laughs> Besides that, but absolutely <laughs> the crazy nothing. crazy angels, all of you out there. There was absolutely nothing that the, um, you know, anybody had done or taught us or anything else that prepared us mm -hmm. for the type of parenting that we needed to have in order to be effective parents for for these children. And it was only after you know starting to get the diagnosis for our children and realizing that our children had disabilities that then I was able to understand that. You know, it wasn't that I was a bad parent. It was that I truly needed a different map. And so that when, you know, my parenting map from, you know, years before with my birth children said, gee, at this intersection you need to take a right, well, maybe with these children, no, you need to take a left, you need to go straight ahead, you need to slow down. But when we're dealing or when we're trying to operate our lives with that old parenting map, the one that we've used, actually usually quite successfully for the years past with our birth children or our other children. And then we try to use that same map with the children with fetal alcohol syndrome. We just don't get to our destination. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important for us to realize that we just need to find different maps. Again, it's that kind of adage of, you know, it's not always that we need to try harder, but we need to try differently. And sometimes that means a different map. And this is also a reason for diagnosis. Yes. Uh, Julie and I have trained together many times and spoken to teachers as well as parents and professionals. And many times they say, 
gee, I think it would be better if we really didn't know everything about this child to sort of give them a chance. I don't want to be biased right. and so forth. But really, you do need to understand, and just what she said is the reason. If you think you are parenting a so-called normal child who does not have organic brain damage, it's not going to work. You're going to be frustrated. They're going to be frustrated. And early intervention is the key here. So the more you know, the earlier you know it, the better the child's going to do, the better time you're going to have parenting. And that's so true. I mean, I hear, I've heard quite frequently, actually, you know, that people, that the teachers don't want mm -hmm. to know. Right. You know, we want to start with a clean slate, and we don't want to be prejudiced towards the child by knowing right. the diagnosis or, or hearing what other teachers or other people have to say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, but we we lose all of that time that we could be adequately servicing our children and providing them with, you know, great um interventions and appropriate academic programs mm -hmm. and supports because we don't want to prejudice ourselves. And, and just the emotional toll that not knowing takes. Parents leaving our clinic at the University of Washington with any kind of a diagnosis will almost always say, I knew I wasn't a bad parent, I just didn't know what to do for That's this right. child. And the children almost to a child say, I knew I wasn't stupid, yeah. I just didn't get it. That's so, right. so the information, even when it's the so-called bad news is really better than not knowing. That's right. That's right. Um, next slide, please. This is a question about, so where do I fit in? And this isn't, you know, initially when I saw this slide, I was thinking about my children. You know, where do they fit in and how do they fit in? Because oftentimes, the, one of the saddest things, I think, for me is when I go to their school and I see one of them, you know, sitting on the sidelines, you know, repeatedly. They want to join in. They want to be part of their peer group. Um, they want to play soccer and, and do those kinds of things. And the majority of the time, they don't fit in for a variety of reasons. You know, sometimes, and we talked about this last week in connection with Danny, that, you know, sometimes it can be because they're very small and so they can't keep up with the other kids. Sometimes their muscle tone or their muscle coordination is not as um, mature as the other children that are out there on the soccer field. But a lot of times it has more to do with the fact that they don't get the rules or they don't remember whose team they're on or which direction they're supposed to be going with the ball at that particular point in time. Or socially, you know, as far as social communication, those are huge areas that my children have difficulty in. You know, the ability to understand what a friend is. How do you make a friend? What do you say? What is appropriate um, boundaries, you know, personal boundaries? You know, where's my sp body in space? Where's your body in space? And, you know, don't interrupt conversations and all of those things. My kids have very hard time doing that. And especially when, you know, you start hitting third, fourth, and, uh, you know, into middle school and senior high, those kinds of tasks are um, just part of everyday life for most children. And for mine, those are tough, tough areas. But the other part about that slide, after I, you know, really stopped to think about, you know, how it affected my children or what it meant with the, the children, I stopped to think about what that slide meant as far as my husband and I goes too. And to wonder about where do we fit in? Because, you know, I don't know about most other foster parents out there, but, you know, we still have the same friends that we had 10 years ago, or mostly. I mean, they're all still on our Christmas card list and all of that. But they're not, they're not the fa families and the friends who would call us on a Saturday night anymore and say, hey, why didn't you bring the kids on over and have dinner and we'll all watch a movie and, you know, all of those kinds of things. That's not my old friends. Yeah. And, you know, even my family, my birth family, I mean, my mom and dad love these children and they accept them and see them as their grandchildren and, and all of that. But, um, you know, if they were going to go out to Arizona to see my youngest sister, they might spend two months there. But when they come out here, the max is about four days. <laughs> and then mom and dad are, that's about <laughs> it. You know, they need to leave. But so it's an issue of, you know, where do we fit in too? And I, and I think I've really can say with, um, you know, a lot of sincerity that most families who are fostering children with fetal alcohol syndrome, um, your closest friends are going to be other parents who are also fostering mm -hmm. children with fetal alcohol syndrome because you kind of need to be able to walk in each other's shoes. And you need to think about when you're older. 
That's right. And uh, Julie's worked it out with uh, her older children, that, that her children are going to be parented by her older children. Because, again, this is a birth-to-death syndrome. That's right. This is not something that even with the best intervention and the earliest intervention will just disappear. This is something that, make, that takes planning from birth to death. That's right. Uh, uh, the, the life of your child as well as your own life. I mean, it's, you know, we hear this phrase all the time, but, you know, that it takes a village to raise a child. But mm -hmm. truly, with children with fetal alcohol syndrome, it does. Yeah, yeah. And we need to have within our community um, enough people to um, spell us when we're tired or to help us out, to be there when our kids need us. And, you know, Dr. Claren says that it takes about four strong, functional adults to raise one child with fetal alcohol syndrome and that's you know that's really true and you know I mean it can be their basketball coach it can be mom and dad it can be an auntie yeah. or a grandma um, but it does you do need to have at least four adults on your team I think to be to keep yourself safe and sound and also as foster parents you sh need to be thinking about respite yes that, and respite should come to your home the children are, if you haven't picked this up already, I hope you definitely will by the end of our broadcast tonight, they really need structure. They need things to stay simple and familiar. When you move children out of the home uh, to get a break, most of the parents tell me that they spend the next week trying to recreate mm -hmm. the, the balance that they had in the child's life before they left. So bringing someone to the home that the children are familiar with, uh, leaving them in the environment that they understand, making sure that the respite care understands the scheduling, that just because it's Friday night, we don't get to stay up till 10. It's 8 o'clock every night or whatever right. the bedtime is. Meals are the same time. It doesn't matter uh, what the setting is or the day is, that everything has to stay on a schedule. And you'll have a lot of happier time out there That's enjoying right. yourself, I think, if you get someone to come into your home rather than you go out. Yeah. I mean, I've we actually have been able to work around that um, piece by having all of our adult daughters mm -hmm. licensed to be okay. in-home daycare providers and our respite providers and um, they also have their provider numbers with uh, for personal care Medicaid or Medicaid personal care and it's made it much easier we tried the out-of-home daycare routine and it just didn't work no. the kids were um, just out of control basically so now they have their own beds they have their own crib and it works really well. Um, the next slide talks about our expectations. And, you know, the greatest gift that you can give to your child is to raise your parenting skills. Now, if you're a teacher out there watching or if you're a caseworker out there watching, just you just need to change the wording around here a little bit. But the greatest gift that you can give to your child is to raise your skills, period, whether it's your parenting or your education um, or your, you know, social working skills. And I think here's a good time to plug child development. Everyone out there who is touching our children, whether it is the teacher, the foster parent, whomever, you need to really understand child development. If you do not know what a three-year-old is supposed to be doing, you will not understand if you have a child who's tracking mm -hmm. or not. So this is a very important issue that everyone really understand because I think especially when we are love our children, they're so cute and they're little particularly and they're doing things that if someone had a little more objectivity, they would see that this child is not developmentally on track. We are very forgiving. We're talking about, oh, he's just like his dad or that's auntie right. so-and-so or, or whatever. And that's why we have the diagnostic period in clinic between 5 and 10 lined up is really probably the best time. The child's brain is bigger. There's more behavior to look at. And also we have someone at school or in other settings who are also looking at the child and can report what they're seeing. A, a teacher who's had 20 years of kindergarten teaching is going to hopefully pick up on a child who's not quite developmentally the same as the other children in the class right. and uh, that's a valuable piece so get out there and take those child development classes. That's right. <laughs> um, the next slide actually though talks about adjusting our expectations and that the greatest <coughs> gift to you, that you can give to yourself is to adjust your expectations. You can't even um, I don't think begin to imagine the, the change in our household when um, we got the first diagnosis on a couple of our foster children. And it was this huge <coughs> paradigm shift in the way that we parented. It was being able to look at these children that not as if they wouldn't do something, but that they couldn't do it. And there's, that's a great 
difference and that really truly explains what working with a child with a disability is all about. It's not that they won't do something, it's that they can't do something. And when my husband Lynn and I were um, able to realize that that's what we were working with with these children, um, we were able to relax. Not only did we adjust our expectations of the children, but we were able to adjust our expectations of ourselves. And so we were able to, you know, relax a little bit and have fun. You know, sometimes pick our battles because you can't, um, you know, fight it all every single day. And so by it being able to adjust our expectations, it really eased up, eased the tension in our household, you know, a lot. And you know, I think. The, many of our children have areas where uh, their brain is more damaged than others. Yes. So you could meet them in a setting where they're really quite normal or above average mm -hmm. in a particular area, assuming then that everything else in their life is going to That's be at right. that level. Then you meet them in the area where they're having the problems and think they're not trying. That's right. And many times our children get labeled as not being cooperative That's right. or, uh, you know, having problems socially when actually what they're dealing with is the central nervous system yeah. damage. I mean I, I look at Tessa who you know just this year now in third grade is finally you know getting services for her written language dis um, disability and her math disability and yet I remember all the last you know like two years where I'd go to teachers conferences and I would hear well you know if Tessa would just stop talking or you know, if Tessa would just sit still, I know she could We're get all thinking, this. Yes, if she would just if sit she would still. just sit still. But you know, it's adjusting the expectations. Right. Yeah. And I think one of the most difficult things that I've come across uh, for all of us, teachers and parents uh, particularly, is that what we want to do is educate our children so that they have a building block that we've helped them with, and then another building block on top of that, and another on that, and another on that. What is difficult with our children is that sometimes the base building block is not there. Right. Or number three is not there out of five. And uh, this is very hard to, th to think about. Right. As a person who's trying to educate your child, what you want is to bring them to the very edge of their potential. But you don't want to push them too hard so that they fail. You also don't want to hold them back assuming that if they can't do math then they're probably not going to be able to do reading or anything That's else right. and this this is how many of our kids get labeled and and uh, I think our their time in school their time even at home is wasted yes. a lot of times because yeah. they're not understood that they don't they have uneven learning uh, uneven skills I think one of the things maybe we mentioned last time is that the researchers in fetal alcohol syndrome are speaking to researchers in Alzheimer's because there is a lot of this sort of faulty thinking mm -hmm. that we find. Yeah. And I mean, and that edge that you talked about, you know, not wanting to, you know, push them over the edge, mm -hmm. but also wanting to, um, you know, give them a little push so that right. they're not held back here too. That edge can change every day. Every day. I mean, you know, you taught Johnny to tie his shoes and he did it on Monday and Tuesday and you asked him to tie his shoes even an hour later or the That's next right. day, and he looks at you like you're speaking Chinese. What are you thinking, possibly? That he doesn't want to cooperate, right. he's not paying attention, he doesn't mind. And it could be that that day, that little brain cell was not connecting. That's right. So, I mean, you know, nobody ever said that parenting um, our children with fetal alcohol syndrome was easy. And it's frustrating you know, for them. It's very they know this. They know that they That's were right. at some point understanding what you were talking yeah. about and not understanding today. Yeah. Um, if the next slide, please, talks about how um, moms feel responsible. And, you know, every mom that I've ever talked to feels responsible for her child's behavior. Um, she feels like she's to blame for that behavior. And she says that um, most professionals have ignored her input. And, matter of fact, I think just about every parent yeah. that has come into our clinic says that the professionals have ignored them. Yeah. Um, not validated not them. Not validated them. them. I mean, now, professionals, we're not all ganging up on you because I think it's just uh, not understanding, not right. understanding what's being dealt with. And there is, again, relief when people come into clinic, even when you get that diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome. Again, parents saying, I knew I wasn't a bad That's parent. Right. I just didn't understand 
how to parent this child. And, you know, so, I mean, we're not asking you as professionals or, you know, even other parents to necessarily agree with what the mom is saying or even like it or accept it, but rather just how important it is for all of us to validate each other, mm -hmm. just to listen non-judgmentally. And the best form of support that we can give that, that mom or that parent then is to refer them on, you know, to another parent, to put them in touch mm -hmm. with other parents and to provide them with the tools that it's going to take to be a better parent. You know, you know, I wish that I had the magic answer for, you know, what do you do when Johnny, you know, is always lying or when Johnny um, collectively gathers everything in the household that doesn't belong to him. I don't have the magic answer um, other than for that last one on that slide, and that's basically to just continue to provide tools. Um, when I do trainings in person, you know, I learn as much from the audience as, as I hope that they learn from me. And, you know, there's... A good successful training to me is when I can then turn around and take home ideas or strategies or interventions that somebody else has shown me and given me. Because believe me, I need every trick in the book. To and you make all it. have tri all of you out there are doing something right, just That's out right. of survival. All That's of right. you really could call us, and we would encourage that. One eight hundred four zero seven nine four eight seven could call us, and we would like you to do that to share your intervention. You are doing something right. That's and right. uh, what we could help you with is to figure out maybe why that's working and what else you can do in other areas that might be really using the same sort of ideas that you're using in those successful interventions. And I've got my piece of paper and my pen here so that when you do call in those ideas and those strategies, I want to write them down because, like I said, I'm, I need every that's right. trick that's available, every tool that's out there. Um, the, the next slide is actually talking about some communication, if we could have the next slide please and that teaching communication is actually about recognizing and honoring the attempts to communicate um, we need to shape appropriate forms of communication and even though most of our children are verbal there oftentimes our children will benefit from alternate forms of communication as as um, Sign language. Sign language, yeah, like sign language or picture exchange. And, you know, their, their primary form of communication will still be verbal. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, at least my children, when they get kind of stuck in something or they get feel like they're being put on the spot, when they have um, something to back up, they see something visual like more or please or, you know, thank mm -hmm. you, um, or they can pull out some picture exchange things and just show me a picture, um, they can get unstuck. And so... It and that's a great easier. way to talk about it, because that's what happens. The brain gets stuck. It does. And the, some of the kids who have done art therapy actually will draw a wall in their head. And when you talk to them about what's going on in their thought processes, they'll say that. I feel like I've, I've come to a wall and I can't get around mm -hmm. it. And what we need to do is teach them how to get around that's it. That's right. So it's, again, what she said. Don't try harder. Try, try differently. Try different. That's right. Mm -hmm. If we could go back to that slide again. Um, it talks about teaching social skills in relevant situations. And here again, I mean, social skills, social communication is probably one of the most difficult areas for my kids. And yet I don't know another area that is um, more important. I mean, we need social skills for everything in our lives, to, from communicating, from um, um, you know, talking on the telephone, conducting business, all of those things. We need to know how to speak socially. And I fought for a long time to get social skills added to my kids' IEPs and in their curriculum. But then I walked in one day, and what they were doing was they were teaching the social skills in the counselor's classroom, in the counselor's room. And here they were going, well, so, okay, Michael, you know, if Johnny takes the football from you out on the playground, what should you do? Well, Michael knows. I mean, you know, he can at that point verbally right. spit out right. and say, oh, well, I need to tell him, please don't do that. That makes me mad. And then they would say, if that doesn't work, then what? Well, then I might need to go find this, you know, the playground supervisor or whatever. He's parroting. He is parroting. Yeah. But I can bet you bottom to dollar that if that scenario was happening out on the playground, um, Michael's not going to say to that child, you know, please don't do that. That makes me angry. <laughs> or right. what? He's going to punch him. We and have a call from call Clarkston. Call from Clarkston. Hello there. 
I'm not hearing. Oh, okay. okay. Here we go. Okay. Hello. No. Is it working? No, I'm not. Oh, hello. Are you the caller? Hello. Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, I was wondering what percentage of these children end up dying of suicide? Well, I don't have any percentages, but I will tell you that Dr. Ann Streisguth has done a longevity study. She's looked at what's called secondary disabilities, mm -hmm. following people in her study for now 25, 30 years, and finding out what happens, particularly in adulthood, to people who have fetal alcohol syndrome. The news, when people do not have proper intervention and support, that village around them unfortunately isn't very good because there are fairly high rates of incarceration and homelessness. And from uh, my just observation in clinic over the last 10 years, the difference between our young kids and our teenagers, and we don't see that many adults in clinic, but it's also uh, cases I've heard in adulthood, that they are much more depressed. Yes. And depression, of course, can lead to suicidal ideation or even attempts. And most of the teenagers we've had in clinic are clinically depressed. What I think happens is that they have had hormones suddenly added to their life, which I feel has affected all of us for all of our lives. They've also been told for 10, 11, 12, 13 years that they're bad, they're stupid, they're slow, they don't fit in, whatever. And on some maybe even cellular level, because I'm not sure they're really imagining or understanding this, but they're really starting to experience that they are not like their peers. Right. And when, like Danny played with five-year-olds uh, and he was eight, no one paid that much attention. It wasn't that big of a deal. But when he became 14 and was found out there in the sandbox every day, pouring sand and, and running cars around and having a great time, it wasn't very acceptable. Right. And he actually, if I told that story last week, I can't remember, but he actually got banned from the play area by the parents of the young children, having never done anything, anything wrong. Uh, wrong. But he, had, uh, he was never allowed to go back into that play area again because they thought it was so strange. So I'm ca I can't give you a percentage, but I say that it's something to watch for as our kids start aging, that, that when we start seeing that depression, mostly what they're dealing with is not that they couldn't learn math and they didn't remember enough to pass their Washington State history class or something. It's their social life. It's that they social need language friends. and social communication. Yeah, they need friends right. and they want friends. And uh, unfortunately, this is how many of our teenagers particularly are fodder for gangs because it's a place to fit in. They can dress like everybody That's else, right. act like everybody else. And many times the gang element loves our kids because they are compliant and their followers. I have three boys who are 16 in the adult prison right now for murder, two are gang related. Essentially, the gang members gave the guns to these two fellows and said, shoot. They don't really understand action and consequence, and it took a lot of explaining to make them understand that they really did end life. This wasn't TV. They, those folks didn't get off the sidewalk and walk away. And when they really understood they had ended life, those two boys both did try to commit suicide. So again, I mean, I don't want to depress you. I don't want to make this gloom and doom. It's just another call for the village that we really have to surround our children with support and love. And, and uh, I, don't, I can't remember if I told the story about Anna Turnbull, whose son has autism. And many of the parents of children with autism mm -hmm. feel that they're very similar to our children with, with FAS and FAE. And she was concerned when he was 15 what would happen to him as he grew up and what was the most important thing in his life. What they determined was friendship. That it wasn't so important that he could do geometry or, or algebra, but that he have friends. And they were looking at their son as the glass half empty and really thought, well, he's not capable of making friends. So they hired a graduate student from a nearby university uh, majoring in psychology who was interested in autism, paid him to hang out with their son for a few hours a week, and over time, the unexpected happened. He developed a relationship with their son and really liked him, introduced him to his friends, and in a few years when uh, he was graduating from high school and these other boys were getting ready to move out of the fraternity house, they wanted him to come and live with him. And the parents were sort of like, oh, we want independent <laughs> living, but gee, I'm not sure if that's a good idea, and were fearful that he would be, you know, in the house, people would move out and leave him. 
they gathered their resources together and bought, put a second mortgage on their home, bought a second home, made him the landlord. And to their surprise, those folks stayed around for several years. Their rent paid for the, the uh, mortgage. And in all that process, she started looking, at, because she has a center called the Beach Center, a counseling center, and she started looking at that whole picture of support and realized that he had more people around him that would help than she thought. The, the high school music teacher thought he was a musical genius. Well, he's echolalic. He can, right. he can pat back rhythms, and uh, uh, she just thought he was great, a great musician. So she said, well, I could take him to a concert. Every once in a while, we could go down and buy some uh, records or CDs and so forth. Then the little boy down the street said, gee, I could, I've always wanted him to play baseball. Taught him how to play, play, play baseball. She brought to the conference I saw her speak at a video of what she calls group action planning. And it was her son in the living room with 20 people sitting around reporting one by one to him what they really liked about him. And then the event that had happened, the, the last okay. activity they had together, what the next plan was. And as they spoke, each one lit a candle, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room when she got done with that video because we were so overwhelmed and touched by the incredible amount of support he had, the love that was really genuinely shown by those people, and the relief for mom and dad. He is probably not going to be one of our suicide statistics. Right. And, you know, back to our caller in Clarkston, you know, I mean, I'm sorry that we don't have specific um, statistics or data in regards to those, you know, the, the rates of suicide. But I do think that we can look at it from the glass half full, too. And that if, you know, one of the things that we really stress is early diagnosis and early intervention. And if that child, um, you know, we're not going to be able to stop the hormones, and we're not necessarily right. going to be able to stop them from knowing that they're a little different than some of their peers. But we can hopefully stop those eight years or so of the, you know, well, if you would just sit still, if you would just stop talking, just try if harder. you would just try harder, I know mm -hmm. that you could do this. You know, don't be so stupid today. You know, if we could stop those eight years, I think that we could change those statistics greatly. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you for you. your call. Thank you. And we had an email question. Is that ready or? OK. Can we go back to the next slide then quickly? Could we do that? OK, right. we're going to go to the email. OK, the question. I missed the beginning of the program, so the question may have been answered. Is it normal for these kids to hoard food, clothes, and other articles? My daughter does this and she is four years old. Um, again, to just stress what Dr. Clarence says, which is that the, the alcohol exposure or the alcohol damage does not cause the behaviors in these children. Um, so just having fetal alcohol syndrome or being exposed to alcohol would not be the trigger necessarily that would cause these children to hoard food or hoard clothes or, or other articles. What it does do, what the alcohol does do, is it changes the structure of the brain. And then if on top of having a differently structured brain, I mean one that's taking in information differently than others or processing the information differently than others, you put on top of that um, oftentimes um, unrealistic expectations or frequent moves or um, realizing that sometimes they have difficulties with boundaries and attachments, that may be then where um, you would see the, the behaviors such as hoarding or mm -hmm. um, you know, worrying about where things may come from the next day. Maybe because at some point in time and, you know, before they came to your home, they were worried about where their next meal would come from or whether there would be clothes. And so with our children who have memory deficits or who have difficulty with um, their brain structure and processing information, they may not be able to generalize then from one situation to another that now they don't need to worry about that. So that, that you know, it's not that the alcohol exposure causes those behaviors specifically, but rather you're starting with a brain that's different. And if we remember last week, we saw the funnel slide right. where 
We're looking at alcohol as absolutely uh, part of the mix that mom says, yes, she drank a great deal every week, every day. We see it in the facial features, the growth deficiency, all that. We have the diagnosis of FAS. We also find out that mom took cocaine, which is another teratogen, something that can damage the fetus physically. We find out that dad had a learning disability, so we have a genetic factor in there. We find out that mom was exposed to some sort of uh, toxin in the environment, on and on. All of this filters down through our funnel into that little drop of distractible if you want to call it that, behavior. Right. Uh, those are words that I don't like those dis words very much, but just behaviors that we're not, not maybe seeing in, in every child. So, you know, it's difficult to answer a question like right. that, especially without knowing the child in the background. So, again, diagnosis is uh, very critical. And, and being aware of what some of those other funnels, mm -hmm. you know, other mm -hmm. kinds of things coming into that child's funnel mm -hmm. may be part of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If we could go back to um, our communication slide and talking about maladaptive and um, problem behaviors that, you know, oftentimes we term um, lying or stealing or those kinds of things as maladaptive behaviors. And in our, I mean, I'm not saying that my children don't lie because they can lie. Um, and they can make things up, but more often than not, they're not lying necessarily to keep themselves out of trouble. Usually what's happening is that they're lying because they truly don't remember. Mm -hmm. They may not remember what the question was that I asked. They may not remember the situation. Um, or as in um, the case of Michael, who has just such a concrete thinking pattern, it's more just rigid thinking. And if I don't have the information, if I don't know the specific words to use to ask him the question directly. He will not, you know, he could answer me in a way that I could interpret as lying. Mm -hmm. Whereas in essence, it's probably just that I'm using the words wrong, you know, and so I really need to have great communication between myself and the teachers. It's I, important. I remember one little boy saying to his mother when she kept accusing him of lying, and you know, she said, why do you keep telling me you cleaned your room when you didn't, or whatever? And he said, well, you don't get as mad at me, Mom, when I tell you uh, something other than I don't know. When I say I don't know, you get, you get madder at me. That's right. And, and we have a follow-up. The email uh, person has yet another question or a follow-up. There we go. Okay, she has been with us since she was one month of age, and we adopted her. Um, you know, we've had children with us, too, since almost from birth. And it's amazing to me, we are seeing now in research that even situations and incidences that are happen happening prior to the birth, that these babies are have the ability to imprint. Um, if you were to sit down, I mean, if, if that mom sat down every single night at 1030 and watched MASH, for example, on TV, and then that baby was born, and at 10.30 every night, MASH came on, or you turned the channel and you watched Seinfeld, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, the baby would have a tendency to actually relax, to feel more comfortable, um, just hearing the, the lead in music to MASH. Mm -hmm. So our children do hear and are able to imprint things even before they're born. And we also know that babies, if their moms are in a constant state of fight and flight throughout the pregnancy where the chemical levels are, you know, serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine levels are constantly out of whack because mom is in a, a situation of domestic violence or just worrying about where her next meal might come from or who, what's going to happen to her baby or to herself, that those having those chemical um, imbalances throughout the pregnancy can also change the structure of the baby's brain and how the baby reacts and responds. So even though the baby may have come to you early on in life and you adopted them, that um, that's not to say that there may not be structural differences in the baby's brain or in that child's brain, which now are 
you know, that they are just processing information differently. Yeah. I mean, there are so many things that can cause brain damage. And, and alcohol could be in the mix of right. the behavior of, of the child you're talking about. Like I said last week, Dr. Claren used to talk about the stew, and FAS is, or alcohol is the potatoes, and uh, cocaine could be the onions, and uh, not having enough nurturing or problems during pregnancy could be something else. I, I was thinking about a film I saw about a, a teenage boy with fetal alcohol syndrome, and the parents were saying, and they had had him, I believe, since birth, and they were saying that he had he did not bring home large objects anymore, like people's bicycles and things, but he continued to bring home pieces of string and so forth. And so, in a way, he was sort of doing what you're talking about with your daughter. He was sort of what seemed to be hoarding and just collecting things. So right. it could be that this is something that has to do, if there was alcohol damage or exposure for your daughter, it could have to do with that, too. It's just very hard to say. And again, these are the reasons why getting diagnoses is very important. Many times, some of the kids we see in clinic we suggest that they get a complete neuropsyche eval right. or something other than a fetal alcohol syndrome examination. I was just going to say that, you know, the importance <coughs> then of a me. multidisciplinary team, you know, approach can be very important when you're trying to, to tweak and to weed out what may be the etiologies to some of the behaviors that you see. And that's when having a team made up of a speech and language pathologist and an OT and a uh, psychologist and a pediatrician and all of those things could be actually very beneficial because it can be very frustrating and very difficult to try and figure out <coughs> where some of these behaviors are coming from. All right, thank you very much. If we can go, um, Back to our maladaptive slides and our communication slides, talking quickly about the lying. Um, basically, just on this one, it's you know, we can get into really big power struggles, and we can talk about you know arguing or moralizing or um, you know whatever, and we're not going to win these kinds of battles with our children. So um, you know, point. We just need to point out the facts to them. Don't let them live in the fantasy worlds. Um, but it, then examine the context and really look at, do I just need to change a word around or do I need to communicate with the teacher and find out what really did happen so that I'm better prepared to be asking the appropriate questions. Next slide, please. Challenging behaviors have traditionally been called inappropriate or maladaptive. Um, I kind of rather think about them as challenging behaviors or just another form of communication. And I know that, you know, if I had a child in my home who was tantruming on me and they were not getting their needs met, you know, for whatever reason their needs were not being met and so they were tantruming, trying to get their attention from me, or um, and all that is is another form of communication at that point. You know, they're not getting what they need from me verbally, uh, or by using verbal communication. So, you know, they, I should expect that they are going to attempt to communicate with me in various other forms. And sometimes those forms are pretty challenging. And we can talk to, about them as being inappropriate or maladaptive, or we can choose to look at it from a more positive aspect and just think of it as a method of, you know, them attempting to, to communicate with us. Um, I, there's, that reminds me of an example uh, that I use in my trainings. I, pre I ask the audience to pretend that you are in the, my class, I'm the teacher, and I've given everybody the math assignment, it's a review, everybody did fine yesterday, and here is Johnny at his desk, he has fetal alcohol syndrome, and he is tapping with his pen. And teacher comes and stands next to him and s asks him uh, why he doesn't do his math, and he says he can't. Well, I want you to think, and we're going to take a break, and I want you to think during the break, what is going on here? Let's think not using your brain, because when I say, That's well, right. what's going on, the teachers say, oh, he's trying to drive me crazy. That's right. <laughs> well, he's not really thinking about you and not trying to drive you crazy. So what is he doing? And there's probably about 100 answers to right. this question. There's no so right So get or into wrong. Johnny's brain during the break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about behavior. That's right. So call us when we come back, 1-800-407-9487. And we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you.